Uh, good morning and welcome to this, the 21st uh, meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Um, we have received some apologies this morning from David Torrance. And can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched on to silent or airplane mode? And can I remind members to keep mobile phones off the tables, please? That would be helpful. Um, we have uh, the first uh, agenda item this morning is the first part of our stage one scrutiny of the gender representation on public Board's bill, and we have two panels this morning, so I'm minded to give about 50 minutes for each panel, so hopefully we'll be concise with our questions, um, and I'll allow you to give us full and detailed answers if you can, that would be incredibly helpful. Uh, I'd like to welcome to committee this morning Talat Yacoub, who is the chair of Women 5050, Suzanne Conlin, who is a board member of the Scottish Women's Convention, and Lindsay Millen, who is a policy manager of Close the Gap. Um, the broadcasting will deal with microphones, so don't worry about pressing buttons or anything. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully have a bit of a free flow of a conversation. But if you want to get in, if you can catch my eye, that would be uh, incredibly helpful. And I think for the sake of uh, transparency, I should uh, declare an interest that I am a steering group member of Women 5050. Uh, uh, and that's uh, uh, something that I'm very passionate about. So uh, we hopefully should hear uh, Good stuff from Women 55th this morning, from all, all the others too. Um, I'm going to go with an opening question, and, and essentially, it's I know that you've provided us with excellent written evidence, uh, and we have lots of written evidence that have been incredibly helpful in helping us understand this, this bill and, and what it does. But my sort of opening question to all three of you, because I think you're coming from slightly different angles in all of this, is that why you think the bill is necessary? Uh, and, and where do you think that will make the difference? And I think, Tala, if we could start with you. Well, um, from given the fact that I'm from Women 5050, we're advocating 50% representation of women across all decision-making um, positions. Our public boards represent key decisions that are being made for um, the good of Scotland, and that includes 51% of the population, which are women. And whilst there is only 35% women on public boards, that means there is a deficit in the decision-making. From my perspective, if we have um, fairness on our boards, we make for better decisions. Now, you can look at um, evidence that has been collated by McKinney you can look at the private boards and the, the um, Davis review and what it reveals to us is that when there is more diversity around a decision making table we have um, more effectiveness more productivity and better profitability so it makes sense for people who are making such fundamental decisions about Scotland for there to be diversity around the table when it impacts a diverse population in the first place so I'm uh, very positive about this bill there are amendments that Women 5050 has put forward to strengthen it which will come as no surprise. Um, however, I think that this is um, an excellent step um, in the right direction and it's one of the three um, campaign asks of the Women 5050 campaign. Okay, thanks. Tell it. Suzanne? Um, for us, one of the reasons we think it's important is partly because that women tell us is important. Our role is very much about telling um, politicians and policymakers what women think um, and they tell us this is important to them. And also because many of these services or decisions these bodies make, we would argue, predominantly affect women more than men. So it's important that women's voices are on the boards of these organisations so can influence the decisions they make. Thank you, Suzanne. Lindsay? Um, well, obviously, the, the women's, women's employment is our main focus and um, occupational segregation where women and men do different types of work and different levels of work is a major issue in Scotland's labour market and it's a drag on growth. And Close the Gap research has shown that if we address occupational segregation at all levels of the labour market, it could be worth £17 billion to the Scottish economy. Um, occupational segregation also is bad for uh, women and bad for the workplace because it leads to a waste of women's talent. So we want to make sure that women are able to access um, these roles because we can then create an, a generation of new role models for young people, um, young women in particular, who can see that these jobs are for them. Um, and obviously we agree with Women 5050 that it's essential that women's voices are represented at all levels of decision making. Because what we know is when women's voices are included, the context of the discussion changes, the content changes, and the decisions that are made change as well. Um, so yes, we're very positive about the bill. Thank, thank you very much. One of the, the, the issues that 
have started some of the debate around about this is how we encourage more women to take that step forward. And we're looking for some ideas on that. So we'd be really keen to hear your ideas on how we encourage more women to step forward. One of the pieces of written evidence we've got is about the golden skirts syndrome, where you have one uh, woman who is on every board uh, because she's incredibly talented and incredibly busy. But how do we widen that out to get a greater diversity from different, maybe different socioeconomic back backgrounds and other backgrounds? Um, how, how, how do we do that? Uh, have you got any ideas on how we do that? And we can maybe interrogate some of those in the process of the, the legislation. So just to um, highlight, um, the golden skirts phenomenon is something that is referred to in Norway when um, there were a number of women who were on multiple boards, but it has been exaggerated to quite an extent. So um, the golden skirts are, um, it's 15% of women, 15% uh, of board members are, are women who are on more than one board. That And uh, with men, it's 10%. So there's a 5% difference there. So I don't think we can, I, I think it's important that we don't exaggerate that there's multiple women on the same boards. In fact, Norway's gone quite far forward in ensuring that doesn't happen. Um, so 15% of the women who are on boards are more than one board and it's 10% of men. So it's not, it's not a, a, a huge concern. I do think what a concern is is to ensure that we have a diversity of women who are around the decision-making table. So I think it's critical that we have women from different socioeconomic backgrounds, BME women, migrant women, LGBT women. I think that's critical because that is part of the diversity that makes good decisions. Right. I think the way in which we can do that is by ensuring that outreach happens in not just those women who are already, already well networked. So it requires public boards and public organisations to link up with community groups. Um, for example, whether it was Amna Women's Resource Centre or the Equality Network, linking up with those groups to ensure that vacancies are, um, are advertised at the local level, at the most grassroots rec le level it could be at. An example of that is um, SES Trans at the moment uh, are doing vacancy um, recruitment and advertising through Equate Scotland, which is where I'm the director of. And that's to ensure that women are, are aware that they can be board members and it's specifically to advertise to women. So there are um, already examples of organisations taking that leap. But I think the most important thing we can do is ensure that public boards have a network of their own of community groups and ensure that it's the community groups that are supporting them in the advertising, training and development to then be um, board members. Yeah. Excellent. Suzanne? I would agree with very much that sentiment. What women are telling us is um, when we ask them about being a board member, that the question is, well, how, how do I find out? Where do I know these vacancies exist? How do I reach it? Um, if they're not within existing networks, how do they find out? And additionally, in terms of, of becoming involved, for a lot of women, it's about time. If, if you, you work full time, you have children, you're, your time's already very precious, and you obviously probably already struggle with childcare. So it's about how we not only encourage women, but how we make it accessible to them um, so that they can feel free to give up their time, often away from their children, to come and be board members. So it's not just about how we get to them, it's about how we encourage them and we give them the, the support to do that. Okay, thank you. Lindsay? Obviously, I agree very much with what my colleagues here have said. Um, there's a number of mechanisms that exist that you can, measures that you can take to encourage women, um, things like um, establishing very clear written policies on how the board will plan to increase the number of women on their board, so like an overarching strategy, um, reviewing their strategies and policies on recruitment, um, and also considering um, specifying within that that the women who they seek to recruit will be as diverse as possible, um, creating a national pool of candidates um, who have been uh, skilled and prepared for public appointments is really important. Um, and what, what we really would like to see is guidance that is prescriptive, um, that details the steps that must be taken and puts the onus on the appointing person um, to encourage, uh, and, and the public body, to encourage women to ensure they receive adequate capacity building um, and ensure that they're taking the steps to advance women's equality. And it's not just important for that to be done at board level. Um, it's really important that these steps are taken at every level of public bodies um, because you're not going to get women um, developing the experience and skills that you need you know, without encouraging that progression throughout the whole organisation. Um, so organisations must ensure that they effectively communicate with women, that board memberships are for them. Um, and again, yes, we must consider um, 
timing of board meetings, how those are scheduled, and access to childcare. Um, that's another consideration. Um, we have done a lot of work on the public sector equality duty, compliance with the duty across public bodies. And there's a lot of overlap with what public bodies are required to do under the duty and what they will be required to do under this bill. Um, so there are, are a lot of things that should already be happening that will contribute to this. But unfortunately, what we've seen as part of our assessment over um, the previous three reporting cycles of the duty is that there's a real lack of evidence of specific steps that have been taken. So it's really important for this bill that we public bodies are required to give evidence that they've taken steps and not just assurances that they're committed to equality. Excellent, thank you very much. Gail, you wanted to come in quick supplementary? Yeah, just a quick um, sup on, on what we were talking about just now. A lot of the women that I speak to, um, we were trying to get people to go on a, a certain board that I was on and they were unsure of the functions of what a board does. They were quite intimidated because, you know, as we know, they're predominantly um, male dominated. So, so how do, I mean, it's a culture shift as well as a legislative change that we have to look at. So how do we as, as elected members and members of the public, community councils, local authorities, how do we get that message out as to how women can be effective and build their confidence up to then apply to these positions? language you often find that the language is overwhelming and that women are intimidated simply by that um, and i agree with you a lot of women are telling us that they don't understand what it means to be a board member they have when they talk about it they don't know what it means what does it mean in terms of what will i have to say what will i contribute what skills do i need and how much time it will take so i do agree that we women are telling us they need to more information about what it is what we are asking of them what they expect to do and we do find in a lot of women are telling us that yeah it's a huge confidence issue that women are not confident in their skills and abilities and I get that I think there's a role to be change the culture and how women view their, their, their value and how they can contribute. Um, with a, a different hat on, um, as Director of Equate Scotland there's a, a partnership that we have with the Scottish Government which is um, evening sessions on training of how to be involved in a public board, what is that public board, um, having women who are on public boards come along and talk about why they were involved, what they've learned from it, what expertise they use whilst being on that board. Um, that has been, I mean, every time we do that event, it is um, sold out. So there's no lack of talent or interest from women to be on public boards. But these events that we do um, shape the likelihood of them pursuing it um, you know, further than their enthusiasm. What I think is really critical is that we balance the confidence building aspect of women with culture change. So for instance, I could give um, women all the confidence building that um, they required, but if there are cultures which are hostile or cultures which are exclusionary, that confidence won't matter. So it's important that we balance the development of women with the challenging of male dominated boards so that when they're there, they're included. Um, the last thing you want is for a woman to have gone to the effort and um, got, uh, tackled barriers, become a board member, and then actually experienced exclusionary behaviour whilst we're there. So whilst we're developing the women, let's also develop our boards. Confidence comes up again and again, and whenever it does, I always refer to it as confidence that the, treat, the system will treat them fairly, that that's the confidence that women should have because they have the ability and the capacity to sit on public boards. Um, discussions with women to make sure they're aware of opportunities and aware of what's involved are obviously really important, but we need to be having discussions with men on boards as well about that culture and about how you know challenging it can be as a woman to come into that culture and to stay there. Um, so that's the kind of the, the flip side of what should be happening. Thanks, Gail. Alex. Hi, you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, in the same spirit of transparency, convener, I should say that I'm also a signatory to Women 5050, and through that have sought to bring about improvements to the Liberal Democrats party selection process, which saw first all women shortlists at the last uh, snap general election. Um, I have a, a number of questions just around um, the, the tension that will exist uh, when we bring this bill in. I'm very supportive of the bill, but there is a lot of pressure on boards nowadays, particularly um, to professionalise, if that, for want of a better word, where um, boards, when they are recruiting new members, will seek a mix of skills that seek the, that fit the challenges facing that board, and and those might be 
um, expertise in the financial sectors, in um, business development, in law, in the rest of it. Um, so we are already asking boards to apply one matrix of filtration on their selection process. And whilst this is absolutely welcome, I think it's absolutely needed to apply a second matrix of filtration on that. Um, will the panel speak to that tension that exists, I think, because these a lot of these skill sets that we're asking boards to recruit from are from professions, and, and certainly in the senior management of these professions, which have been traditionally dominated by men. It's often quite difficult to find women who are available from very high positions in, say, a financial services organisation, given the predominance of male domination. And, and how do we address that? How do we keep that skills mix and have the diversity we're seeking? I suppose I would argue I'm not entirely sure it's that difficult to find the women. I think the women are there if you, you look hard enough. Um, and also, I do think organisations, while I totally accept they need some professional skills, they have to think as an organisation what they're doing, that, that it's not just about professional skills, it's about who influences what they do. And if you, again, particularly provide, you influence public policy, for example, then you need to, you need to represent the public that you're representing. It can't just be about professionals. It's got to be representing the whole population. So... It, I think they have to also think about, yes, they need professional skills, but they have to look at what other skills are important to their, their organisation. There's another aspect of this, which is um, if we want more women to be at the head of finance, if we want more women to be higher up in the legal field, perhaps giving them board membership will give them the experience to get those jobs. So there is an aspect here, which is the two are intrinsically linked. And in actual fact, surely we want our public bodies to be doing their equalities duty to help in the widest way possible. So if I have um, a woman who, and, and if we're looking at finance and legal field, the vast majority of middle managers or below are women. Um, the vast majority of law graduates are women. Um, so if we're looking for expertise, well, isn't, that, isn't this the perfect opportunity to create expertise, not just in your board, but also in the financial and legal field by providing those experience opportunities? I also think that it's m much like what Suzanne was saying. Actually, um, our public boards also require lived experience on them. And I don't think we should negate the importance of lived experience um, in, 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 in the want for professionalism or somebody who's at the top of their career. That lived experience in public policy making is absolutely critical. And that's one of the many things that women can bring to public boards. Great, excellent answer, thank you. Um, the meat of this bill is in section four, paragraph two and three, in terms of consideration of candidates for me. I think this is where you know, the, the actual mechanism of achieving diversity um, is set out. Um, but I'm a bit concerned about, you know, the fact that we're leaving a lot of this to personal judgment. And personal judgment is influenced by prejudice and culture and patriarchy and all of these things. Um, and I wonder if we can explore the, the issue of selection. And the fact we, we talked in preparation for this bill about the things like anonymous sifting, where we we'll take out all the sort of biometric details. Um, but I'm concerned that that has an inherent bias within it as well, because um, we know that men will quite readily sort of talk about their own achievements far more, um, well, they'll do that far more often than, than perhaps women might. And secondly, they will have had opportunities that women um, might not have had because of the result of the prejudice that is inherent within our system that this bill is trying to uh, break down. Um, how can we improve this bill to make sure that this isn't just left a, a subjective view as to who is best qualified before we get to this tiebreaker situation that section two paragraph, section four paragraph two defines? See, see before you, the panel come in here, I know that, that Annie has uh, a line of question that complements that. So I think I'll, I'll come to Annie first for you to, uh, because the two things complement yeah. each other and it means then you can answer more fully. Annie. Cheers, thanks convener. Good morning. Um, yeah, following on from what Alex said, when you sort of when I've read the bill and my understanding of what the bill is sort of a same and it's looking at consideration of candidates and um, appointment, we're still merit is the underpinning fact of how we achieve the best candidate for the role. Um, and a question for me would be, if it came to Alex was talking about anonymity of applications, and mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a vacancy on an eight-person board. There was already four, four males on it and three females, and we had one vacancy. There isn't any way that we can make sure that that board, mem that board position is filled by a female, because at the end of the day, if the two candidates are the same, 
then merit is the underlying thing that's got to be the thing that appoints that person. And as long as the scrutiny has been there, a man can be appointed. So how do we achieve 50-50 representation when merit is at the heart of this bill? Um, this is one of the reasons we are absolutely uh, clear that the bill has to be supported by prescriptive guidance that details exactly the steps that must be taken. Um, because what we know from performers of the public sector equality duty is public bodies have said that one of the biggest barriers to performance of the duty is the lack of clarity in the guidance on the particular actions that they can take to advance a advance equality for each of the protected characteristics. And as a result of the lack of specificity, what we've seen in performance of the duty is a real homogenization of equalities work, which doesn't really result in positive change for anyone. Um, when it comes to the issue of merit, I think obviously we're, there's reams of evidence that uh, having you know, a gender diversity quotas bring merit to boards. They, increase the overall level of merit because you're drawing candidates from a wider pool than the kind of old boys networks that are typically where we see board candidates coming through from. But there's also the question of what we consider as merit and what we consider as the requirements for the role. And that comes back to that mix of skills and mix of perspectives that having gender diversity on boards brings because it's not just about, you know, particular skills. It's about that lived experience, which is absolutely key for excellence in public um, service delivery. Um, sorry. Um, I think to, to answer the first point about the kind of selection process, I appreciate it will be a challenge to try and remove bias, um, but I think for, for organisations that are, are male dominated at the moment, then they will especially have to ensure that their selection process doesn't influenced by that, whether it's a not, can't be an all-male panel. If they, sh they are struggling, then they need to then look at sourcing out our support to get females on the panel so there's a balanced view. Um, in terms of merit, I suppose we would argue that where there isn't 50-50, then quotas should step in rather than merit. If a, if a board doesn't have 50-50, then it sh they, they should be balanced up the 50-50 that are opposed to merit, and that's where we come from. I, th I think it's really important, and as, as uh, Lindsay has said, there is no shortage of evidence to tell us that these measures do not prevent merit, they promote merit. And time and time again, they promote merit, because they are. it means that we are looking at a wider talent pool, and it means that we are reaching out to the merit that we have not had on boards thus far, and, and that's the point. Um, furthermore, evidence has shown us that when, and particularly if you look at private sector boards, the vast majority of evidence that we have um, across European countries is either on political representation or private boards, not public boards. But if you look at both of those, political and private boards, what we have seen is that the average merit is increased because women have joined the board. So if anything, they are increasing the skills base. And, and I, I think that's, that's, that's critical. Um, when we get to a position, the, the entire purpose of that section of the bill is about getting to a point where you are making a decision, a tiebreaker decision between two people with equal merit. So if we are, if we are at the point where we are pursuing two people, one is a man and one is a woman, and we can evidence that they have equal merit, I don't think there is any issue whatsoever in picking the woman who has that equal merit, provided you are able to show that they have evidence where they can support and enhance the work of the board. I mean, that is the very purpose of this particular um, bill. Um, the second part about selection processes, um, one of the things that Women 5050 has put into the, their response um, is that we think it's really important that there's a lot of um, responsibility on the appointing person, and that appointing person needs to be trained, uh, needs to be trained in unconscious bias, needs to be trained in good outreach and recruitment to ensure that their individual biases and their panel biases are not getting in the way of the decision making, um, and also to ensure that there are no all male panels when making recruitment decisions to that that I forgot to make. Um, I absolutely would like to echo Talat's point on um, the support that must be given to people who have uh, responsibility for recruitment, guidance on transparent and robust recruitment and decision making processes are essential that include an equalities aspect that detail to people how these decisions can be influenced by assumptions about women's skills and capabilities um, and also requiring public bodies to report publicly 
um, on the steps that they've taken to encourage and deal with applications from women. And I think um, there was evidence put forward from Muriel Robison and Nicole Busby of the University of Glasgow that the legislation should include a redress mechanism for unsuccessful candidates of the underrepresented sex. Um, which um, means that they are, the organisation is obliged to provide to the unsuccessful candidate on request um, the qualify, qualification criteria on which the selection was based, the objective comparative assessment of those criteria, and where relevant any considerations that have tilted the balance in favour of the other candidate where there is a 50-50 situation. Annie, you want to come back in, and I know yeah. Alex wants to come back in, and Jamie's got a supplementary, so Annie. <laughs> Just very quickly. I mean, I don't think there's anyone here who wouldn't want to encourage more women into STEM subjects, onto public boards, into politics, whatever it may be. Um, I'm all for encouraging women to do it. The other part of my question I was going to ask is then, if we have anonymity of sifting at the beginning, and it's two males who come out as the two best candidates, what, ha what would you suggest would happen then if there was one place on the board but two males were the two best candidates from the, from the outset? The question that I would have is that, um, is this bill pursuing the, uh, is it guiding people to have anonymity of, this, of the applications? So I'm, I'm not sure if that is the direction the bill is going in. I, it, that would be dependent on what guide comes out of it. What I would say is, First and foremost, before the anonymity of the names, if what we're trying to pursue is gender equality, it's not the anonymity of the names, it's the tackling of the bias. So when those names are in front of you, you are looking at them objectively. I think that is more critical than having um, names removed from an application process, particularly if the entire purpose is to get more women on and the tiebreaker is between a man and a woman, or two women or two men, whatever that becomes. But the tiebreaker in this case is about favouring the woman. So the anonymity of the names might actually get in the way of what it is this bill is trying to achieve. I think what's critical um, is the anonymity might be, might be a way forward, but it can't be instead of training, development, unconscious bias, tackling, and trying to do a lot about predetermined judgments. Alex, you want to come back in? Yes, just very briefly. Um, this touches on something Talat just said and Lindsay said as well in terms of, in respect of the guidance that will underpin this legislation. My experience as a, a public policy operative in the voluntary sector for 15 years before getting elected is that oftentimes, with the best of intention, guidance is where good legislation goes to die. And unless it's implemented properly, unless it has the robust teeth, then it means absolutely nothing and will gather dust on the shelf. And refreshes of the guidance, as many as they may be, uh, don't actually help that. So in which case, Case, I think you absolutely hit upon this, both of you, that this is the guidance as to training and the rest of it um, is, is so crucial to this bill. Is there something that actually needs to be escalated from the guidance you would like to see and put on the face of the bill? And I, I think, Talat, you mentioned there were amendments you'd like to see and perhaps you would sort of delineate them. Yes, so um, I think this is an opportunity for me to talk about non-compliance sanctions. So I think it's um, critical. Um, if you are ha trying to create a, a, a bill with teeth, um, if you need to have some kind of non-compliance sanctions involved in it, otherwise it is a set of recommendations that people can or can't take. Um, a perfect example of that is in Spain, where there is a 30% um, a bill to get 30% women onto private boards. There are no sanctions, so therefore it currently it remains at 19%. Some change has been made, but the change has been slow. Um, so one of the things that I would certainly recommend is that there needs to be mandatory reporting, a mandatory action plan of what steps you plan to take in the run-up to December 2020. And non compliance sanctions uh, to ensure that you get to December 2022 with 50 50. Just been passed a note by my colleagues here that says the Scottish Government doesn't, in fact, intend to publish guidance under this bill, which is quite troubling. So I would certainly support that. And just final question on that, considering what you just said. Um, in terms of non compliance sanctions, fully support that. But how do you police that? If, it, if a lot of what we're talking about is unconscious bias, it's very difficult to evidence the, that that has been a factor. Well, we're not, we're not, it's not non-compliance on how biased you've been. It's non-compliance on the bottom line of whether you have 50% women. So it's, it's not about what judgments you've taken. It's about what steps have you taken to reach 50%. And that in itself overcomes some of the bias because you therefore have to make extra effort to get women in the room. So the non-compliance is about the numbers, not necessarily about whether you were biased in your judgment making. 
Okay, I want to try and get Jamie. Are you still got a supplementary on this this subject? So a supplementary on this because I've got Mary's coming in from a different well, angle. It depends what Mary's asking. <laughs> you, go, go for it. Go for it. I'll trust well, you. I've, go for yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's all relevant. It, it, I think it goes back to uh, it probably goes back to Annie's original question around uh, how we um, approach uh, uh, the perception of, of of selection on merit and how this bill does or doesn't achieve that. M my understanding coming to this fresh. Uh, and, and new in reading the bill as it's, as, as it's currently laid out is that if we're in a situation where there's a vacancy on a public board and there's more than one candidate and there's at least one male and one female candidate, my understanding is that the process that the appointing person goes through is as follows. The, the first uh, selection criteria is that they make a, uh, an appointment on the best qualified candidate. And if no particular candidate is best qualified, then the appointing can, uh, person identifies candidates who are equally qualified. And if there are two candidates who are equally qualified and one is male and one is female, the appointing person must give preference to the female in order to achieve the gender representation objective. Now, I may get uh, corrected on that later by the, the clerks or the, or the bill team, but that is my current understanding. How does that address the critique of this uh, bill, uh, if, when it comes down to the wire, um, the appointment is made on the legislation that preference is given to the female candidate, not on merit, assuming that both candidates are subjectively of equal merit, and that's a very vague statement. How does somebody determine whether you're the best qualified or equally qualified? Again, it, it does seem very loosely worded, in my view, and I find it a little bit confusing. As if I was the board member making the appointment, I, I would be very confused by this wording. Which is why, sorry. No, no, um, <laughs> I suppose just to say, I mean, we talked about the appointee making a decision on then best merit, but if we've already established that there's an equal merit, then the merit discussion isn't really relevant anymore. And we have to go back to what the spirit of this bill is, and the spirit of this bill is to achieve 50-50. So I, I would argue that the merit discussion has, has been had, but if you've established that they are of equal merit, granted there maybe needs support about how you make that assessment. Um, but I, I think the merit discussion has, has been had at that point, and it's about the spirit of the bill being about 50-50. Absolutely. I, I think what you um, have highlighted there about, well, the vagueness between what is uh, best qualified, what is equal merit, if anything, um, emphasises why there needs there should be guidance alongside the bill. So creating some guidance about how do you establish merit, how do you um, do outreach, how do you do training and development, how do you ensure that you are um, having the widest possible um, circle of women to choose from so that you can get the merit you're looking for. Um, I think the spirit of the bill is to get women there and I think if you are um, reaching out to a wide range of women, you will get the merit that you're looking for. I don't see any evidence that tells me otherwise, that there wouldn't be the merit there that you need. Um, but I think your point emphasises the need for guidance alongside this bill. There, I think that obviously shows why it's absolutely essential that we have robust recruitment processes that, you know, deliver objective comparison of criteria and that that's recorded and on, on record and that public bodies are required to report on the steps that they've taken. Okay. Mary. Thank you, um, convener, and good morning, um, panel. In a way, my question follows on from, from the line of questioning that, that we've had, and my colleagues Alec, Alex pointed out um, Section 4 of the Bill. And Section 5 and 6 of the Bill, I think, are, are equally as, as important. And some of the criticism that we've had in relation to the Bill is that it's a positive step, but it doesn't go far enough because there are no sanctions in it. And I would be interested in, in your views on the wording of, of Section 5.1, where it says, an appointing person for a public board must take such steps as it considers appropriate to encourage women. Now, I, I think that language is far too loose. And if you leave the language like that, and again, the next paragraph talks about steps it considers appropriate, um, and, and those are words, those two words are repeated frequently, considers appropriate. Now, what I consider appropriate, what you consider appropriate, and what someone else considers appropriate could be entirely different. So is that strong enough, or does that need strengthened to be far more descriptive and far more explicit in what is expected of boards to encourage women? Uh, 
Yeah, I think we agree that it should be stronger. And if it's not strong within the bill, then again, back to the guidance, being clear on what is appropriate. Um, and to be honest, it's back to the bottom line. If organisations don't meet 50-50, then they should have to publish it and they should have to be accountable for how they've got there. And, and it should be reviewed of how, what they deemed appropriate, of what did they do enough. Um, it should be subject to more scrutiny, I think, of because appropriate, I think any bill or any guidance is never going to cover everything because, again, what we view appropriate can be subjective. So it's about how you review the bottom line, how do you review the outcomes and how you review how they got there and how you critique it. And organisations will need to learn that, but it's about supporting them and ensuring that we hold them accountable to that. I don't think it's strong enough. I think appropriate is um, vague. Does that mean financial investment? Does that mean outreach? Does that mean training and development? Does that mean um, taking on your own quotas? Does it... And what it leaves is those boards that are already close to 50% and have a um, strategy or an or a, or a internal wish to be diverse will go further than those boards who perhaps need it and don't know where to begin or have a resistance to it. So, again, this is why there should be guidance. And what does appropriate, considers appropriate, actually mean? And what I would recommend is that guidance is written with equality organisations like ourselves, which says, here are five things that you can do which the bill deems appropriate. And what that creates is some coherence across recruitment and across action being taken. And that means that the compliance and reporting is much more easy to um, to assess because there is something being assessed, they are being assessed under. Considers appropriate is too vague a measurement um, to be able to take any kind of action or any support of a board. We also share um, engenders' concern that that cre may create an inadvertent loophole um, that will allow public bodies to appoint men where they should be appointing women and because there's evidence that shows that groups who are adversely impacted by gender quotas like men who are already in those leadership positions, male incumbents can respond strategically in order to circumvent the impact of those quotas. Um, so again, this comes back to our point that we want to see um, clear prescriptive guidance um, on what steps should be taken because precedent exists of public bodies not complying with equalities legislation. Um, the public sector equality duty is a, a really good example of that or a bad example of that where it's not uncommon um, for public bodies to still at this point in 2017 when the public sector equality duty came into to play in 2012 to not be publishing their gender pay gaps and not be publishing their occupational segregation information. And those are two things that exist on the face of that legislation. So when you look underneath at the steps that they are required to take, how they are required to use that information to advance equality, which in this case would be, how are you going to take steps to get women onto these boards? There's even less evidence of that happening. So we want to see... Um, the steps that are required to be taken or, or an action plan to be included on in the bill itself that public bodies are required to produce an action plan and report it and we also um, feel very strongly that non-compliance sanctions and robust enforcement are essential. Okay. I, I want to come on to talk about the financial implications of the bill in a second but I just want to ask you a, a very um, brief question before I do that. One of the other criticisms that we've had of the bill is that it's a, mis a missed opportunity in relation to people with disabilities. And while I absolutely accept and understand the, the ethos of this bill to encourage more women, there has been criticism that it's a missed opportunity for disabled people. And there has also been criticism that the bill gives a, a binary definition of gender. And there are a, a section of people that will be completely missed out. And I'd be interested in, in your view on this. Women 5050 supports the Equality Network's um, uh, response, which is about ensuring that uh, the pursuit of women on boards is, inclu is inclusive of trans women, particularly. Um, I, think it's, I think it's important that when we're talking about 51% of the population, we are talking about those who self-identify as women as well, who report as women. Um, and I think they should be inclusive of that when we only have 36% on our boards and 51% of the population identifying as women. I think it's quite fair that this bill is about that 51%, um, but it needs to be inclusive of trans women. Um, uh, and furthermore, I think it's also, 
it goes back to the original point that I made about a diverse set of women being included in the outreach of this. So that includes disabled women, that includes um, LBT women, that includes um, BME women, uh, women from social, different socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's important that when we are talking about guidance, again, I keep coming back to this, but that guidance needs to be about pursuing a diverse audience of women so that you are ensuring that disabled women are engaged um, through this bill. Yeah, we would agree with that, and we think very much when it comes to the reporting aspects, then yes, it should be not just about women on the board, it should be about all the protected characteristics. Organisations should be very open and clear about who's on the board um, and, and who they open up to. It shouldn't just be about women or just one group of people. There are many different types of women, um, and so it's about how the organisations report all the protected characteristics, not just gender. Yeah, we've seen, um, again, coming back to the public sector equality duty, a real increasing of homogenisation of equalities work, which shows little recognition that the causes of inequality experienced by protected groups are different, as are the solutions. So it absolutely is right that the bill targets um, the barriers faced by women in the workplace, but also um, the systemic barriers to representation faced by um, women who share other protected characteristics. For instance, disabled women experience um, higher levels of discrimination and stigma um, in, in employment and in trying to progress and to access positions like this. So we absolutely would want to see included in guidance um, the specification that the group of women that you're targeting goes beyond just the characteristic of being a woman and that you have to strive to have a diverse group of women represented. Okay, thank you. Can, can I move? Sorry, yeah, Convener, on you go. did you want on to you come go. in? No, no, no on you no. go. Uh, can I ask now about the, the financial burden that will be placed on, on boards if, if this legislation is passed? And I want to, to, to briefly read um, a paragraph from the, the explanatory notes where it says that um, boards should evaluate and target, target advertising strategies and outreach <coughs> events to better reach and appeal to women. Um, the financial memorandum it se itself says the Scottish Government does not consider there will be a res resource attached to making the case for greater board diversity, given that the majority of boards covered by the bill are already working towards achieving this outcome, or greater gender diversity via voluntary commitments. Now, if we want to have a, a programme to attract women to become board members, whether that's through... Um, advertising or, or any other mean, it means, it would seem to me that there is a cost um, implication on, on a board. And the greater diversity that we have in a board, if we have more women on, on boards, um, there, there may be a need to um, support women through childcare, support women through um, maternity leave, paternity leave for, for men, whatever. So it would seem to me that there is a financial implication on boards. Um, mostly at, at the outset where they are trying to encourage women. If, if you want to um, promote inclusion, you need to do something to do that. Advertising strategies are not cheap. They don't come with no cost. So what do you see will be the financial burden on boards? I'm not... I suppose the, the point we want to make is that if you are a public board that influences public policy, then it's a duty, I would argue, that you have to have a diverse board. It shouldn't be seen as an extra thing you have to pay for. Um, and it's not just about diversity in terms of gender. If you are a, a board, it's about having diversity of skills, and that should apply to all your board. You want a board that represents your population. So it's not just about saying this is an extra thing we have to do. I would argue that it's something that public boards should be doing already, that it's a duty to ensure that they represent the people of this country, and that that's not just about getting women on the board. I yes, I would argue, yeah. yeah. I would, I, say, I would say that the, the work to encourage applications from women overlaps with the work public bodies should already be doing under the public sector equality duty. This does not represent an additional legislative burden. If they are already doing the work that they are required to do, gathering data on recruitment, development and retention, analysing that data and developing action plans and equality outcomes that seek to advance equality across their organisation as a whole, there is a massive overlap with what they will be asked to do in terms of you know, getting more women onto boards. Um, and also, you know, when, when it comes to, to cost attached, we know that greater gender diversity on boards leads to 
excellence in public service delivery, which means efficient use of public funds. So it's, it's definitely a quid pro quo if there is a cost involved. I think um, one of the things I want to highlight is that there may be a financial implication in um, outreach, for example, um, which, as Lindsay said, should already be happening. And there is, but one of the things that I don't concede is that it can be called a financial burden. Um, and I think I, I would be really weary of referring to it as any kind of financial burden when it's a financial responsibility, um, from my perspective. Very helpful. Thank you. Annie. So it means just following from Mary's point just before, um, and. I, I listen to what you're saying, we've got to make sure we've got a diverse group of women, be it LGBT women, women with disabilities. Would we then be looking to make sure that the, the male appointments on boards included LGBT, BME, protected characteristics? So should we be looking to make sure that there's a diverse range of men on boards as well? So that representative of the representative of the society. So that's just a... And how do we do that? Is that about a campaign and making sure we go to different groups of people to encourage? <coughs> I think this comes back to the point I made right at the beginning about boards having uh, connections with and working with community groups to ensure that they are pursuing um, diversity across the board. I think it is absolutely right and proper that this bill is about 51% of the population who are women, who are grossly underrepresented at every level of decision making across Scotland. I think it's right that this is focusing on that. I think that it's it, part of public sector equality duty is you being diverse across the board, across protected characteristics. So if that's something that a board is not seeing and what they're seeing are white, male, able-bodied, straight men, then the, there is already imperative on them to pursue diversity. Um, this bill is about 51% of the population who are grossly underrepresented, but there is already a duty on them to pursue diversity. And of course, that is something that they should already be pursuing. Gail. Thanks, convener. Um, and sorry, I jumped in earlier on with it saying good morning and welcome, and thank you for coming. Um, and as we're declaring interest as well, I'm also a signatory to Women 5050. Um, <coughs> we spoke to um, officials last week, and um, I made the point about how Christina and I spoke to the resolution at the SNP conference about this very issue. And I'm convinced that it's needed and the legislation is required. But what would you say to such groups as the Institute of Directors that say that they don't think that um, they're not in favour of a random proportion being attached to one group and that they would rather see a holistic approach of reporting on diversity as well as action taken to encourage women through training and mentoring, which we hear is already happening. And we know that the um, proportion of women on boards is already increasing. So, in your opinion, why is the legislation needed? Okay, so holistic approaches um, and whilst welcome is what we've been doing for a long time and we're at 36%. I think the data in front of us tells us why this bill is, is in place. Um, voluntary mechanisms that don't come with any compliance, um, non-compliance sanctions, that don't come with a bill, with a push from government, um, get us to around 30 to 35 percent which is where we are now evidence tells us again and again that we reach a, a plateau in in the the number of women that come forward and are are recruited onto boards um, i whilst i believe that there should be a holistic approach what this bill does is ensure that that holistic approach is being taken that's the purpose of it right now the holistic approach can be um, taken on or not, and, and that, that's, that's the purpose. Um, there are, you can look at particularly on private boards um, across um, Europe where we look at what countries have pursued um, and where there are um, voluntary mechanisms, where there is um, holistic approaches that are about training and development, they tend to put the onus on the women, they don't tend to put the onus on the culture change, the board change that we have already discussed, and they do not get us to 50%. Again, we're talking about decision makers, we're talking about fair representation, and I think it is um, right that where holistic measures have not worked, training, development, um, soft and gentle approaches have been done for decades and not got us to 50%. Yeah, we would uh, agree with that approach, that, that although holistic approaches have been in place, that they're not doing enough. Um, and if they were adequate, then we would be at 50-50, to be blunt. Um, and I suppose, 
they have example goes very much from the women that speak to us directly and not, what they're really saying is why they want this bill because they're saying their barriers and all we're looking for is a level playing field they're not looking for special treatment they just want to level the playing field allow them to access it that's all they want um, and that's a very simplistic but a clear quote from a woman to say why they want this yeah, again, I think this comes back to what we know about equalities work. Homogenised equalities work doesn't work. You, you can't do something that will advance equality for all of the nine protected characteristics at the one time without taking specific steps that meet the needs and challenge the barriers that each um, group faces. So that is absolutely right that this group is, this, this bill is looking at advancing equality for women. Final question from me. Who do you think should monitor it? To me. <laughs> Essentially, uh, a role for the Equality and Human Rights Commission in monitoring it because they are already responsible for monitoring the um, compliance with the public sector equality duty. There obviously is a question of resource there, um, and it would be essential that if the Commission was required to monitor this, that they were adequately resourced to do so. Um, I think in gender, in their submission, also made reference to. Um, Public Standards Commissioner. I'm not sure. I, the, yes, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life is also another suggestion that I've seen and um, what Engender said on that made a lot of sense. But again, obviously, resource is an issue and whoever is um, asked to enforce compliance should be given the teeth to do so and the resources to do so. Okay. To get, sorry, tell up. I um, Women's Health Duty completely backs Engender's proposal on this, um, and one of the things that Engender has written in their submission, and we have as well, is the fact that it's whatever um, monitor, whoever is monitoring this, they should be reporting to the Scottish Government and then to Scottish Parliament, so that it is public um, and it's not happening um, behind closed doors, and that the debate takes place um, in our chamber as well. Okay. Thank you very much. I, think, I don't think we've exhausted all of our questions, but we've exhausted our time. Uh, and we have a second panel this morning to hear from as well. We're incredibly grateful for your contributions this morning. And if you go away and you think I should have said this, please let us know, because we've still got a bit, of, a bit of way to go on the journey in this bill. So thank you so much. I'm going to suspend committee for a five minute comfort break. So if you could be back in your seats in five minutes, we we'll change the panel. Now suspend.
Good morning and welcome back to the Equality and Human Rights Committee and continuing on with our uh, scrutiny of the Gender Representation in Public Boards Bill. We are, have our second panel of this morning and I'm delighted to welcome to the committee Rory McPherson who is the Chair of the Law Society of Scotland's Equalities and Law Committee of the Law Society of Scotland, Professor Susan Deakin who is the Chair of the Institute of Directors. Good morning and welcome back to Parliament. Susan, um, and Professor Muriel Robinson, who is a guest lecturer at the School of Law of the University of Glasgow. Can I thank you so much for coming this morning, and I know that you were in the gallery to hear some of the evidence that we had from the organisations this morning. I'm going to do a, a sort of a brief opener and ask, because you, you are three different aspects coming from three different areas, um, and I'm quite keen to get your summarisation of the bill and, and what you think it means. So I don't know if Rory want to start with you first. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, uh, the, the Law Society's response uh, can be summarised that uh, in 2017 across the EU, uh, we already have five countries having mandatory quotas in female board membership. Belgium, France, Germany, Italy and Norway. Ten have either an optional quota or comply and explain best practice, um, such as Denmark, Greece, Austria, Slovenia, Finland. Um, uh, we uh, in the United Kingdom uh, have s some 10 years of voluntary schemes and after at the end of that 10 years uh, we are yet to achieve uh, gender diversity on public boards. So against that background the Law Society is supportive of this legislation uh, looking at uh, other jurisdictions in Europe where the legisl co comparable legislation has been used successfully and uh, whilst Norway uh, might be seen uh, in 2006, I think it was, as relatively controversial. All the evidence shows that very quickly uh, the discussion moved on um, and uh, uh, the evidence is in, that in Norway there is simply no debate about the issue now. Thank you. Muriel. Thank you. Um, well, I've for a very long time taken interest in positive action and legislation to uh, in relation to positive action and achieve that. So. I'm particularly interested and pleased to see um, legislation which essentially takes forward um, uh, a requirement to uh, uh, undertake positive action measures. Most legislation, of course, is just permissive rather than um, prescriptive. It's mostly voluntary rather than a requirement. So th this, this is, is very good to see um, a bill of this um, uh, nature. Um, I did put in um, a, a response with my colleague from the University of uh, Strathclyde to the consultation draft of the, the bill. And uh, what I would say is that I've, there are some very welcome changes, I think, in this, uh, the bill as introduced that you have been um, consulting on, particularly um, the duty to take steps around um, a, 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 in relation to um, uh, the uh, objective the duty to report and the target date, these are all good um, developments. I think there are some less welcome changes from my point of view. Um, uh, the apparent removal of transgender women from uh, the, the bill and also the removal of the exceptional circumstances defence um, uh, and replacement with a justification type defence, which we might pick up on um, uh, later. So these are less welcome changes from my point of view. It seems to me that the the bill is, however, perhaps um, uh, uh, limited in its scope. I think it would be, uh, it's a very important that it, it is as efficient and effective as it can be, given that we are restricted in this case to look at non-executive, non-employee members of boards. So even if the, 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 this achieves 100% um, success, we're still not going to have gender balance on our boards as such. Um, and it, it does interest me, uh, given the limited scope of the bill, that actually everything that is done here could be applied to employees. Um, it wouldn't, that wouldn't breach European law, it wouldn't breach the Equality Act, and I don't think, and I think therefore that it would be permitted by your new other exception, Section 37 exception, which is the broader, more general exception in relation to the functions of, 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 of public authorities. So those are some of my opening um, uh, remarks, but happy to follow up on any of those and, and, and others. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to be here today. 
Uh, I think this is a really important discussion and indeed not just the, the discussion on the bill itself but a lot of the wider related issues and as you've had a nod to convener, um, having over a period now of some 30 odd years been around various debates both about how we ensure that more women get into more leadership roles right across business and public life um, and also how we get good governance of not least our public services, then for me this is an area of, of real interest. So I'm very happy to do anything I can to, to try and help feed in thoughts or ideas to the committee. The IOD as an organisation, uh, just to, to briefly explain this, uh, many of you will be aware of this, the idea was set up um, by Royal, Royal Charter back in 1906 operates across the UK and has members spanning right across the private, public and third sectors, organisations big and small, commercial, not-for-profit and many other variations in between. Indeed, many members work on board positions across different sectors and organisations, which is something that we would actively encourage. I chair the IOD in Scotland. Um, I, so it's one of a number of things I do, so I'm drawn from among the, the volunteer membership, if you like, for a, a temporary period of time um, to take on the chair's role. Um, and that's where I come from today. So I think some of the things that um, I'd like to comment on today, if this is of, of use to members, is some of the wider issues around boards, governance con uh, considerations, and how you achieve where the thing that I think all of us want to do, not least in our public bodies, is get really good, effective, balanced boards. And that, I think, is a name that all of us share. I think the, the question is really how to achieve that. And as I say, anything I can do to contribute to that discussion, I will. Thank you very much. Alex. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, I, I'm aware that you were sat in on the last um, exchange and you will have heard some of the arguments deployed in that. Uh, I think in talking in the margins with my colleagues while we were suspended, um, it was clear to me that, that we, we all agree that this is an important board, but some of us actually feel that it could be strengthened in the way that the last panel um, defined, particularly around the use of sanctions. Now, Scottish... Scots law has a range of existing sanctions around recruitment for certain things. The most extreme example, perhaps, is um, in the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Act, for example, which makes it an offence to knowingly employ somebody who is barred from working with children or vulnerable adults, and that's why we have the Protection of Vulnerable Groups scheme. But there is a range of, a spectrum of options in between, and I just wonder, if we were to strengthen this bill with the use of sanctions, what do you think would be available to us in that regard, and what would be proportionate? Yes, I'm happy to, to, to respond to, to, to that. Um, uh, well, certainly, I think that um, I would like to, to see further sanctions in, 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 in the bill, but that, and that is a, a weakness of it. In terms of what those sanctions might be, as you have said, um, Mr. Clamerton, it's important that they are proportionate. I suppose we have to take account of the fact that we're talking about public authorities, aren't we? And so that some of the sanctions, such as striking off and, and large fines that we see in Europe, would probably not be appropriate or, or proportionate. Um, so th th that would bring me to think about um, uh, a, an alignment, as has, I think, been discussed with the public sector equality duties um, and the requirements um, that, uh, that they have in relation to um, uh, reporting um, and, and the like. And so that would, if there was to be an alignment with the public sector equality duties, it might be then, as discussed earlier, that the Equality and Human Rights Commission can play a role because that, that, that there is a role that they can play in relation to sanctions or failures um, in relation to the public sector equality duty. So it, it would be that kind of sanction, that so several types of sanctions that I would be thinking would be um, uh, appropriate. Uh, uh, if I may come in at this point, uh, in the response, um, uh, as you'll have seen, uh, the Law Society's position is that there is some scepticism as to the effectiveness of the legislation. Uh, one of the important concepts of legislation is that legislation has an impact. Um, and uh, uh, whilst um, I haven't 
uh, analysed uh, uh, Muriel's uh, um, uh, uh, very helpful description of the possible penalties uh, or uh, civil remedies, uh, I do make the observation that uh, absent some form of sanction or remedy system, that it could be described that the legislation is essentially uh, legislation reflecting the voluntary codes. And the reason the Law Society is sceptical is because we have had the voluntary codes for a number of years and it hasn't achieved that end. Uh, when we look across Europe, there are countries which have a, 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 a regimes for enforcement. The most famous regime is the Norwegian regi regime. Um, uh, when um, uh, the requirement was to have at least 40% of company board members, um, uh, or if essentially the company would be delisted. Now, that obviously couldn't apply in a public sector uh, board, but w one can certainly envisage uh, possible remedies through the uh, court system um, uh, where uh, the boards don't achieve, a, 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 don't achieve uh, their uh, gender quotas. Um, and in the absence of a sanction, uh, one would wonder what what other type of legislation would succeed if one looks at other legislation that is socially useful? Uh, if you don't have a sanction, uh, uh, would road traffic legislation operate if there is no san sanction for people speeding, just on a very simplistic basis? Um, and in this sense, it, it would seem logical to have some form of enforcement mechanism. And the absence of enforcement mechanism, I think the Law Society's position is, um, uh, as we say, uh, that we are sceptical. Um, so I think uh, we'd, we'd all agree that a reporting duty would certainly strengthen that. It concentrates minds, it embarrasses people who are falling behind um, to, to pull their socks up. Um, you touched also, though, on guidance, and I think you know, it was something of a revelation to some of us um, in the last session that the government aren't planning to put statutory guidance behind this. Is that a, a mistake, or is that um, does that give the lie to the fact that this is really, just as you say, reflecting good practice, and that's all they want to do with this legislation? And if so, what um, teeth could we give the bill under statutory guidance? I, I think it would be um, helpful in any legislation to provide guidance as to the interpretation of the legislation. Um, uh, legislation uh, is a useful instrument for uh, bodies to interpret whether they are the courts or other bodies, um, but guidance around the legislation, how the legislation is meant to be interpreted, uh, can be incredibly useful and can provide subtle uh, um, uh, guidance uh, for those who are actually required to implement it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the person who is the uh, appointing person or the board generally. Uh, in relation to the reports on the operation of the Act, um, I think the, the, uh, the legislation does provide that the public authority must uh, publish reports. Um, I think there has been comment that there are requirements in other legislation, the public sector quality duties, to publish reports. Um, the phrase publication can be a fairly broad concept. Um, uh, where those are published and are they readily available to people out with the organisation, I think would be critical. Um, uh, publication of the report in an internal organisation may not have uh, a useful impact. Hey, on the same, in the same vein, convener, um, my colleague Mary Fee rightly pointed out that the weakness of the language is um, that an appointing person of a public board must take such steps as it considers appropriate, and that phrase is repeated several times in the bill um, in respect of the duties on those appointing persons. Does the panel have experience of that phrase working in the past? Um, is it strong enough? And how can we strengthen it in terms of the language of the bill? Well, I've experienced not that particular phrase, but I did in my response, I think, say that the problem with that and similar phrases like that, such as have due regard, is that um, a public authority, an appointing person, could say, oh, well, we've thought about this and we don't think there's anything that's appropriate. <laughs> and uh, that looks as if that would comply with that section. If, if there were um, sanctions for failure, then any court looking at that would say, well, you've thought about it um, and that's all that required you to do. So I would say that that certainly um, needs to be, there needs to be specific provision in relation to what the steps actually are in relation to all the good practice that was discussed by colleagues in the last um, uh, session. It seems to me that 
there needs to be requirements to uh, report and review and revise, which might be in guidance, they might even be in a code of practice, they might be in regulations. So it doesn't necessarily need to just, just be guidance, it seems to me there could be something even perhaps stronger than that, perhaps code of practice, perhaps even in regulations. Yes, can I maybe pick up on some of the themes that, that Alec Cole Hamilton's raised, but come at it from a different angle. I think um, the question on any piece of legislation, by definition, should be precise. Legislation is precise. Um, and I think the committee's right, therefore, you know, to think about the detail of the bill. I think, though, that is also one of the challenges of legislating in this area, that you're in terrain which is about culture change and about achieving change across a very wide range of areas. And in some respects, the more precise you are, then the more problems and po possible unintended consequences you could stack up in terms of actually getting to where you want to be. And as I say, I think the shared objective for everybody is about having good, strong balance boards um, for all our public bodies um, and for getting more women in, in, into to leadership roles. So I think I, I would urge caution and this, I know, is one of the reasons why, you know, the IOD in all its work and research in this area, both in Scotland and the UK, has urged caution on other occasions where legislative proposals have been considered because um, with the, the right intent underpinning them, sometimes there can be under, unintended consequences through some of that precision. If I take the issue of reporting, for example, um, I don't think you should ever underestimate how much reporting transparency in and of itself can be a huge driver for change. Um, and actually in the private sector, you know, a lot of the work that's been done around FTSE 100, 250 companies and so on over recent years, that that transparency, shining a light on what's going on, has in and of itself driven a lot of change. Now this is Scottish public bodies that we're talking about here. So, you know, you can increase by a factor of 100, I guess, the number of different ways that we can shine a light on what's going on in Scottish public bodies that doesn't require you to put everything into the letter of the law. Um, I mean, it's nearly 20 years ago now that as Scottish Health Minister, I did a, a review of NHS governance in Scotland, um, much of which is actually still in place even. Um, and we spent an inordinate amount of time, um, you know, really thinking about how we could get that mix of structures and people and practices um, you know that, that were needed for that particular service at that particular time obviously you know others since have done more and I'm sure done better um, but my point is most of those types of changes that have been done that have actually delivered changes in culture and practice haven't necessarily been done by legislative measures and the precision that's in legislation but by comprehensive effort to really drive culture change part of which is reporting transparency and in Scotland through the parliament through Audit Scotland through various inspectorates through ministers themselves who who are the, the people in question actually in, in the legislation itself. Ministers themselves also, both through their own actions and also through being held to account by this parliament, you know, have enormous capability to really drive change and drive that, 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 that transparency to make sure there's a really clear and shared understanding um, of what is going on within our public bodies. And if I may just add one other point, which perhaps we could come back to in more detail, it's, and a number of people in their submissions, um, including ourselves, have made reference to this. The bill, of course, focuses on the non-executive members of the board, because that's where the power to legislate exists. But every bit as, if, if, if not more important, is what's going on with the executive appointments in our public bodies across Scotland. And there is a danger that by focusing on the areas that it's possible to legislate on, that actually it displaces energy and attention and effort to really do some of the big change that needs to be done, I would argue, to get both better gender balance, but better balance more generally in many of our executive appointments in our public bodies in Scotland. Okay, Gail. No, good morning, panel. Um, we touched on it when um, Alec Cole Hamilton asked about sanctions and um, Rory, you've spoken about what happens in other countries. I would just like to, it, it's quite a wide ranging um, couple of questions. Does the bill as it stands 
meet your expectations. How does it compare with what the legislation looks like in other countries, particularly Norway, if it's a, a good example? Um, and is there anything that can be done to, to strengthen it? I know we've touched on some of the areas. Um, and there was a, an interesting point made in the last panel about um, encouraging women to, to have the confidence to be on boards, because we know that they're there and we know they have the skills. Um, that will then have a knock-on effect for role models for younger people to encourage them into other sectors of public life. Is there any knock-on effect for the private sector as well? Well, um, uh, uh, if I can um, say that um, uh, the, the legislation is different, very different from the Norwegian example. Um, uh, the Norwegian example was quite um, a stringent imposition of a requirement. Uh, there was a comparative approach in other parts of other Nordic countries in Sweden where they didn't introduce uh, equivalent legislation in Sweden. They achieved, um, uh, as I understand it, uh, gender equality without the legislation. I think in, in Scotland, um, uh, this legislation builds on the experience of the voluntary codes and usefully builds on the experience of the voluntary codes, uh, but also picks up uh, in the area of competence of the Scottish Parliament in the, uh, in the uh, non-executive directors, uh, precisely because the experience of the voluntary codes has been that they have not achieved um, the relatively low levels of uh, uh, gender equality that the voluntary codes aim to achieve. Um, uh, uh, there is a different debate uh, uh, beyond governance of public bodies into private organisations. And that is, uh, I would suggest, a, uh, a slightly different debate where it's not a question of governance of public resources, the provision of public um, uh, provision of support to uh, the, the Scottish pop population. Um, I, I would say that uh, uh, one of the comments that was made earlier this morning uh, was about encouraging uh, uh, people to come through uh, to be on public boards. Uh, the Lost Society of Scotland, uh, as we identify, is uh, a body of uh, some uh, slightly over 11,000 Scottish solicitors. Uh, as is well reported, more than half of those uh, are women. Um, I think you can identify that there's a pool of slightly over um, uh, 5,500 uh, people who I would suggest are relatively well qualified to be on public boards. Uh, I would suggest that that would identify that there is the capability of uh, achieving uh, uh, gender equality, if only from the legal profession, and there are other professions, I think, that could equally uh, uh, come up to uh, uh, that kind of standard. Um, and many individuals at different parts of their uh, professional career would see the benefit, I think, being on a public board, um, uh, uh, partially as career advancement, but also enhancing their uh, uh, greater understanding of uh, the role of a solicitor in society. I'm sorry if I've not answered all of your questions. No, that's it's grand. Thanks. Thank you. Could I pick up on just the last part of your question there? Um, I'm, I'm something of a zealot, I think, actually, these days, of uh, encouraging cross-fertilisation across sectors and boundaries and organisations. I think there's an enormous amount of learning to be done in this space across private, public and third sector. And across all of them, there are examples of really, really good practice that is really driving sustained culture change. Um, and frankly, one of the reasons why I, I'm involved with IOD in Scotland is because it's one of the very few organisations that actually draws a thread across that leadership community in Scotland and people are working across boards in all these different organisations. And I believe passionately that Scotland PLC needs to have good boards across all these, these good organisations so that um, we do our best for the country and the economy. Um, so, um, we do a lot in the space of actually trying to, to do that cross-fertilisation. And as I said, a number of people, um, a growing number of people, and I think this is really healthy, um, you know, are taking on non-executive positions alongside their executive roles and crossing sectors to do that in, in different directions. Um, and I think the more that we can do to encourage that, the better. Similarly, the work that we do, and I have to pay tribute to a range of other organisations, including like the Women's Enterprise Scotland, Changing the Chemistry and so on, you know, are, are engaged in you know, really systematic efforts to train and develop 
um, not just potential board members, and much of that focus specifically on women, but also critically to train others, like board chairs, on what they can do to ensure that they get balanced boards in place and create an environment that's effective and enabling different people to participate and con contribute and to make sure that they get a real genuine mix of skills and experience around the table. And that's, that's why I would stress um, the importance too of, of for, for sometimes dubbed cognitive diversity, that you know, it's really important that you know, we don't just focus on the kind of diversity that is very measurable and tangible in getting a good balance board together, but we also think about that diversity of thought and experience that is so important. But the more that we can do between any of us to actually drive change across sectors and to learn across sectors, I think the, be the, the better it can be. And Scotland's a small country and we can do that at scale in a way that other parts of the UK can't, in my view. Mr. Ross, you also men asked, I think, about what works in other countries, and I, and I did mention one or two things about what uh, fines and the like there. Um, uh, we, we've got limit, there's a limit to what can be done um, here, given the powers that um, the Parliament has. Um, but one thing that I uh, could also mention in terms of sanctions um, is about giving redress to individuals, considering that possibility. Um, whereby individuals could challenge specifically why the public body didn't apply the gender equality objective on their particular um, appointment. At the very least, I think that would focus the minds of the public authority, because if you know you're going to be requested for detailed feedback, you need to think very carefully why you have made the decision and not used the objective in the particular um, uh, circumstances. And interesting enough, that was suggested in the draft EU directive around increasing um, diversity on on, um, uh, on public bo on, on, on boards on company boards, so it's, it's something that's been been proposed at U European level. Um, can I just follow up on that point? It's a, it's a small legal point actually. If boards are going to be um, required to tell people why they weren't suitable for the job, and uh, a male applicant finds out that he was overlooked in favour of a female candidate, would this legislation then prevent him from taking any legal action? Well, it wouldn't prevent him, but it would be used as a defence by the public authority. The public authority would be able to use the, the, the Equality Act where that was appropriate and this Act to explain and justify their, um, their, their, their position. Thanks. I, I, I think also, um, uh, if I may say, uh, the converse is also true that um, uh, the female candidate, when boards do achieve gender equality, uh, will, would be able to take that information uh, uh, back. Um, I think uh, it's understandable that um, uh, one can speculate about the hypothetical situation of two uh, precisely equally qualified candidates. I don't think the experience in Europe is that there has, in fact, been such difficulties of identically qualified candidates uh, um, uh, that has caused the hindrance to uh, other jurisdictions that have brought in mandatory quotas. True, then the person will always get appointed on merit rather than gender. Uh, I, I, I think my view, my view, and I think the Law Society's view is this: this legislation encourages um, uh, appointing out of the hundred percent of the Scottish population the person uh, um, uh, best suited on merit. I think. Uh, a question might arise, given the gender profile, um, why against the 100% of the Scottish population uh, the uh, profile of public boards doesn't, uh, seems to represent a smaller group in society? You want to pick that Susan? Up? Yeah, can Susan, do you want to come back in first? I suspect, my, is it, if it's the same training? It's very, it's very similar. It's it's again, it's just about the probably the anonymity of applications as well, because obviously if the anonymity of applications exists, potentially you could have two male candidates who come out as the lead candidate for it. So therefore it would be quite difficult to achieve 50-50 if we don't have something set in to start with. Really glad you, you, you raised that point again, because this was exactly the sort of terrain that um, I wanted to comment further on. 
it is incredibly difficult at this kind of discussion to really drill down into how you operationalise some, you know, some of these kind of practices. But I did try quite hard when I was reading through the bill and the various explanatory notes and so on to think through, having been involved in a lot of board rec recruitment and so on in my time, I, I tried to think through how I would actually apply that and particularly how it would be married together with the current public appointments process in Scotland. And I, I think there are a number of, if you like, operational challenges in there that, that I don't think can be addressed, as I say, fully in, in, in this type of discussion, but I would encourage both the committee and the Scottish Government, you know, to, to test fully and widely um, just how in practice you would play out some of the questions that you've raised there and whether there are changes that might that would need to be made in the public, the, the current practices around the public appointments process in Scotland to make sure that they actually, you know, work in tandem. So, you know, when I express concern about this, this bill as it stands, it's, it, it is partly that point about how legislation can just sometimes be a blunt instrument that has unintended consequences. Um, but it, this, you are in terrain here where ultimately people need to sit and, well, people need to apply, be encouraged to apply, want to apply, and then to have a sift process and a selection process and ultimately an appointment and a training process and so on that all works um, to get a good outcome. And at the moment, it feels to me like there's a lot of these issues are in danger of maybe not getting the attention that they deserve because people are rightly very keen to achieve gender balance. Um, and it's important, I think, that these, these questions are worked through. A supplementary and a question? Yes. And then a Thank Jamie. Okay, convener, and, and good morning. I just wanted to pick up on something, Susan, that you said in response um, to, to Gail, when you, when you spoke about driving change and, and taking a more holistic approach across the, the areas that, that you represent. And I wonder if you could perhaps tell us currently what is done to share good practice across all the different sectors that you represent? Um, well, I don't purport to represent well, all, of, all of them. Um, and I would always say that there's, everybody could do a lot more. But the Scottish... The way I look at it, the way I articulate this, is that the Scottish ecosystem, if you like, um, partly because we've now had almost 20 years of devolution and all that goes with that. Um, there are networks and there's connectivity between organisations um, that's really quite special that I think we can build on and do a lot more to learn from. So, in answer to your question in a specific sense, some of the things that, for example, an organisation like IOD Scotland does, but as I say, often try and do it in partnership with some of the other, other organisations that I've mentioned, um, and sometimes with individual companies, or indeed even Scottish Government itself, you know, we've done stuff with particularly around developing trustees for charity boards and so on. So I think some of it is just very, very practical, good grounded training and development activity. Um, some of it is mentoring. Um, and, you know, many of us who, you who have acted as mentors over the years, you know, it's a hugely rewarding thing to do. Um, you know, for the mentor as well as hopefully being useful for the, the mentee, if you like. Um, the big challenge, and I touched on it earlier, um, and is, is how you develop the executive, what's loosely called the, the, or generally called the executive pipeline in any organisation. And that's the bit, um, you know, I've been part to more discussions and events and this and I care to remember over the years. Um, and, you know, I, I think there are areas where, I'm talking very generically here, you know, there are areas where there's been significant change and progress made, and I'm talking here the wider culture shift, not just the, the, the gender balance or the diversity within top teams, if you like. Um, but, you know, I think there's been a lot of areas where actually many of us of a certain age would have expected greater and better change by this time in our life, if you like, if we'd been predicting things 30 years ago. And... Again, I'm not sure always that compulsion, whether it be through legislation or other measures, is necessarily the best way to get underneath what's stopping some of that deeper culture change. Um, I don't purport to have the answers, but I think organisations like the IOD and some of the others I've mentioned can be hugely effective brokerage organisations um, to work between 
different organisations and really to focus, I think I forgot to say this at the beginning, which is what I meant to do, actually one of the core Royal Charter purposes of the IOD is, and I quote, to promote the study, research and development of the law and practice of corporate governance. Um, so there's a big research capability within the organisation as well as lots of networks and con connections both across the UK and here in Scotland. Um, so I think, you know, the, irrespective of where the committee decides to go with this bill, um, in addition, there has to be all that wider array of activity that really seeks to drive that, that change in culture and practice. I hope that answers your question. Sorry, I don't know if yes, I gave you enough yes, specifics. Yes, it, it does. It, it's been very helpful. So if, if some of the language was tightened up in the bill and there, there was statutory guidance and there was some kind of reporting or audit mechanism, do you then think it would be helpful to put something in the guidance about building and developing on the current shared practice that already exists and building on the networks that are already there? I think we would continue to urge caution about what you actually put into primary legislation or indeed even sec secondary legislation. I, th I think that's really what, um, you know, is one of the main messages that I would want to feed into this, this committee today. I don't know, Muriel, did you want to come in on that before I well, ask well, the question? Just to pick up on, it's interesting that Professor Deacon says about um, over 30 years expecting to have greater and better changes and we haven't had them and we've had the voluntary approach over all of these 30 years and, and, and much, much more. And so I think that's why we, we would say you, 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 we need to have po provision for positive action requirements for positive action like, um, uh, like, like this. I wonder if I can pick up on one or two other things in relation to the point about merit that perhaps Ms Wells mentioned, um, because one of the things in my response I said to the consultation draft was about how merit is in fact contested. Um, and this is a difficulty, and again this comes back to the need for uh, guidance for people, to, to, to channel people in the right direction really. Um, and so issues like um, uh, no further help with what equally qualified might mean, unlike Mr McPherson, personally I think that there are very often situations when in fact two candidates are equally qualified and the, the, the panel weights some factor or other which suits them, maybe fit with their organisation, is what they weight. Here we say you must weight gender. That's what you weight if their gender is an underrepresentation. And it's really just to ensure that people are, are doing that, they're thinking this through and that they're actually, that, that's what they are doing. Can I briefly just come, come back on a couple of points there, convener? Is that okay? Yes, of course. Um, just my reference to change over, over 30 years. Um, can I just be, be clear? I was talking there about the broad kind of culture change that I think many, would have, or many of us would have wanted to have seen in organisations generally um, and more widely in society. And my point is that that is a really complex mix of factors that feeds into that. And... We're only really, I think, going to get sustained change in the workplace when we have a much more holistic conversation about um, life and work and family and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I just want to be clear, because that is all the more reason, in my view, why you have to be very cautious about quotas of any sort. I mean, again, throughout my entire adult life, I feel that I've always been involved in these debates around quotas, whether it be in organisations, whether it be in politics or whatever. Um, and I totally understand why quotas have a place and some boards voluntarily choose to do that. If they think that's right for their organisation and for the kind of skills mix that they need, um, I worry greatly, and, and again, the idea as an organisation, we worry greatly about you know having a quota that applies across a very diverse range of boards and in one area alone and how that might un it, you know, how that might impact on the desire to actually get the balanced board that you want. The other thing I'm going to say as a woman, I suppose, who's held leadership roles in my time, is I think we have to respect the fact that a number of women are still uncomfortable about being part of a process which involves a quota system. Now, there are very different views among women as there are among men, everybody, you know, about quotas. But I, I just, for the record, note um, that I know a, a number of women are still very uncomfortable about that because no matter how robust the selection process is, rightly or wrongly, or wrongly, <laughs> I'd argue, 
it, it creates a climate where it starts to be inferred or suggested that women aren't there on merit. And that, I think, is one of the potential unintended consequences of relying overly heavily um, on quotas. So none of these things are to go against, you know, as I say, the high-level aims that everybody has here. It's just words of caution along the way. We've only got a few minutes left, so you need to be very quick because I've still got Jamie to come in as well, and I want to give him some time. I will. I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief because I asked the same question of the previous the previous panel, but but I'll shorten it. Um, do you see any financial implications on on boards for um, taking any steps to in, increase and improve diversity, given what the previous panel said about they should be already doing this? No. <laughs> that was short and sweet. Thank you. Excellent. I tend to agree, and it's partly because, again, the, la the last panel, the public sector equality duty re already requires people to be thinking about positive action, in my view. That's a requirement of it. So they should be thinking about positive action across the board in relation to all of the protected characteristics. They should already be doing this, that this is just focusing on one particular protected char characteristic. You could argue, and I was thinking this listened to that last discussion, if it's all already happening and therefore there's no cost, then why do you need legislation? If you need legislation, then you're going to need to spend money too if you're going to really drive the kind of change that, that's needed. Okay. Thank you. Jamie. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry we have not a lot of time left. Um, can I just check a statistic uh, which I'm, I'm reading conflicting numbers on? Uh, in the IOD's submission, it says that uh, the current level of female representation public boards is at 42% and increasing. Is that my understanding of your submission? I didn't write the submission, but okay. I did see the 42% figure. Actually, I think it's in the SPICE document. Yeah, I think that's where it came from. And the only reason I flag up is because the Close the Gap uh, submission was 36%, and that's where the confusion has come to me. And, and there is a reason why I asked that, not just to be fiddly with the numbers. Six percentage points actually makes quite a difference psychologically. 36% to me sounds like a third. 42% and increasing sounds like we're heading in the right direction. And this is kind of where the, my dichotomy in, the, in this bill is manifesting itself. I hear both sides of the argument. I, I think, Susan, you're probably one of the lone voices that we'll have in this room who uh, represents a substantial part of Scotland's economy and business community uh, who thinks that the legislation is not required. That's why I want to check that number because I think if you're saying to me that it is 42% and it's increasing in, a, in, the, uh, in the right, that we're heading towards 50% anyway, therefore the legislation is less required. It makes more, your argument makes more sense, but if it's 36%, it sounds like we're still far away from it. The 42% is on page three of the SPICE briefing, so I presume that's okay. where um, our people took okay. it from. So I guess my question I is... I did wonder, by the way, about when reading that number in the SPICE briefing, my question about it was um, whether that was looking at boards as a whole or just non-executives. I thought there needed to be more clarity around that. So I think there is more statistical information needs to be flushed out. I, I, I agree. I, I, I think there's, you can be obviously be selective of statistics to show one side of an argument over another. But I think what, what struck me about this bill is, is how narrow it is. Uh, what it's actually focusing on is just public boards, and not just within public organisations, but the non-executive boards within those organisations. And it really only applies to situations where there isn't a best qualified candidate. So it's, it seems very narrow. Now, the, the conversation uh, in this room seems to be more around how it, the bill should be beefened up and strengthened or have uh, more implications in terms of sanctions and reporting uh, requirements. Um, and it's been absolutely intriguing to hear somebody in the room say why they don't think there's a need for a quota at all, because, uh, which I believe is your, 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 what, what you're arguing, is that this bill pl places a mandatory duty which you don't think needs to exist. But to be clear, and I, and I as an organisation, completely respect the, you know, the right of the parliament and working with government to work this through to, to get the best outcome, which, as I say, is an outcome that we, we all want. I think what, what both in the written submission um, from the IOD and in the comments I've made today, I think, again, you know, what we're saying is, is just to urge caution. As you, as you rightly say, this, this is about legislating um, across the piece in the same way for all public bodies. It's about legislating for one part of each board, i.e. the non-executives, and it's about legislating for one aspect of diversity on a board. 
Um, and what we are really saying is that given that the overarching aim and purpose from a good governance point of view is to get good, strong, balanced boards with that rich mix of skills and experience and diversity within them, we're really just posing the question and saying, you know, are you sure that, that this is going to actually deliver that outcome or might there be unintended consequences? In a sense, we're then <laughs> putting it back to you as policy makers to then keep working that through, having hopefully taken some of those questions and thoughts on board. It, it seems very much that, that, that voluntary measures aren't working because we're not achieving uh, true proportionality and representation, which is why I, I, I'm sympathetic, perhaps, to the, the objectives of the bill. But I do take on board your point uh, around some of the unintended consequences of placing a quota if it diverts attention from where the real issue uh, issues are around getting proper representation at executive level uh, across business in the third sector and public sector. Um, I, I still haven't quite walked away from this meeting with a full understanding as, as to why a, a quota will do less than a voluntary measure, because the voluntary measures to me seems, it seems not to be working. So I'm still a little bit, there's a gap in my, my understanding of how, how le letting organic processes uh, see, see through will get us to where we need to be. Or is it your view that it doesn't need to be 50-50, is a, perhaps a, a view in certain boards? I, I, I must stress again, the, 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 I want to be very clear that we, we're not seeking to be prescriptive here, really. We're seeking to, to everybody um, that's involved in work in this area and discussion in this area, I think, is, is open-minded to trying to develop the most effective ways of getting to the place that we all want to be. Um, so I see it as a bit of a shared learning journey, if you like. I, I would hate either as an individual or the organisation that I represent for us you know, just to be in, adopting some kind of black and white yes or no position around this. I, I, I really want to stress that. I think, um, you've, I think your questioning there has raised exactly some of, the, some of the things that, you know, I would encourage you to, to look into further. That, that question about the numbers, what, what as I say, that 42% figure is lifted directly from, from the SPICE briefing. What exactly does that mean? How, you know, is, is it the case that the gap is, as you say, 8% or is it, you know, one of the numbers that others have quoted? I don't know. As I say, we've just, you know, operated from that information. Um, I think, I do have to stress this, this overarching point, though, about balance, a balanced board. I just saying don't divorce the, you know, the equalities issues here from the governance issues. That it is, I mean, we're talking about boards here that have oversight of hugely complex and important public services across Scotland and billions of pounds of taxpayers' money. And all of us want to make sure that the, the mix of people around that table, and as I say, that diversity comes as, as the previous panel explored too, you know, in many different shapes and forms, including among the men and the women themselves, there has to be that diverse mix. And you're actually not talking about boards of thousands of people, you're talking about maybe, what, 10, a dozen appointments, maybe less in some cases than non-executives. So it's not, you know, there are knock-on effects with one appointment as a knock-on effect with somebody else. And you can't afford to leave a big, important, complex board, you know, with a real gap somewhere in terms of the skills and knowledge that it needs. So those are the things we'd encourage you just to explore further. Okay. Susan, earlier you mentioned some operational challenges. Have you got an example of an operational challenge it could maybe face? I think it's really the terrain that we've been in some of that yeah, discussion. Okay. It's to work through, and I'm sure Scottish Government have, have done that and you know, can probably provide further information on this, and I just haven't come across it. But you know, it's working through, if you were really to, to play out the letter of the legislation as currently proposed, alongside the existing public appointments process in Scotland, does it actually all hang together and take you to the place that you want it to? And will people involved in that process actually be able to manage some of these issues around um, the, the, the numbers and the merit question and the anonymity issues and so on. Okay, thank you. Muriel, at the beginning, you had mentioned two things that are now not in the bill, and it was the, uh, it doesn't include trans women, uh, and we will interrogate that as we go along, I think. But there's one thing you said about removal of exceptional circumstances. Can you give us... Uh, some insight into what is you it, meant is by it that? It's clause four, I think, where on the consultation draft it was there was reference to only. Um, so it was really it's, it's to ensure that there are um, circumstances when you might might say 
the disabled person is, 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 is equally well qualified and therefore it's, we, we've got a problem with our diversity in relation to disabled people, we, we'll select that person. Um, I, I think that the, the language now moving from exceptional circumstances to a much broader justification um, scenario perhaps gives too much scope to the, um, the appointing um, board in terms of when they can say we're not going to follow this um, uh, the requirement to, to, to achieve the, the, the objective. Um, that, that gives us some other uh, avenues to, to, to look at. Rory, did you want to comment on that? Um, yes, um, if I may, may go back, um, uh, one of the points that Nuriel um, uh, discussed earlier was the issue of uh, when there were uh, candidates of equal standing. Um, uh, although I um, essentially responded to what I understood was essentially a hypothetical scenario of two identically qualified uh, scenarios, uh, two identified qualified uh, candidates. Happy to defer to Muriel's expertise in this area. Um, I'm read, uh, happy to concede that there will be in instances um, where there are in fact two um, identically qualified candidates. Um, uh, and I don't have a difficulty with, uh, the Law Society doesn't have a difficulty with the bill in that context. I was simply um, uh, putting forward uh, or responding to what sometimes put forward as a hypothetical position that it is difficult because what if one gets to uh, identify uh, qualified candidates? My own experience is uh, one can often uh, characterise individuals as identically, uh, as identically qualified, but in fact, when you look at it, in fact, they're not identically qualified. And I think the, the, the bill is useful in identifying an opportunity to uh, uh, look at gender diversity. Um, I do think uh, that uh, there are some challenges around the bill, uh, around uh, the appointing person's um, uh, 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 rather uh, subjective assessment um, uh, uh, and uh, th one would hope that the reporting requirements would uh, tease that out. Um, on the broader issue, as the society commented, um, uh, there may be opportunities, and one uh, certainly the society would hope uh, to come back in a future date uh, to look at uh, future legislation dealing with other uh, protected characteristics. Uh, that may be dealt, that may, however. Uh, be tied in with uh, legislative uh, competence issues. Um, uh, but at present, uh, the legislation uh, achieve, uh, seeks to achieve an end. Um, the society's concern is the absence of a f form of penalty or a redress, um, uh, such as saying the duties can be enforced in the court with appropriate remedies um, uh, and providing penalties for non-compliance. The legislation may be criticised as essentially a statutory voluntary code. And that is essentially the society's concern. Well, we have really run out of time now, and you've given us lots of questions to ask the government, I suspect. Um, and we're really grateful for your contributions this morning. And my usual proviso, if you go away and you think I should have said something, please let us know uh, in the course of the, the deliberations on this bill. Uh, we're very grateful to you this morning, and thank you very much. And I'm going to close the meeting now to go into private session.